Imagine it's a Friday night, July 25th, 1969, in Topanga Canyon, a rural community in the hills just outside Los Angeles. You're a 21-year-old musician. You've played in bands all over San Francisco and L.A., and one of your former bandmates is a close friend, an ex-con named Charlie Manson. Right now, you're on a mission for Manson. You're parked in front of a house of a guy you know, a part-time drug dealer. He owes you money, money you've pledged you'll give to Manson once you collect it. He says he needs the cash for something he calls helter-skelter. You don't really buy into all of Charlie's crazy schemes, but you want to impress him with how tough you are. Manson has a group of followers he calls the family, mostly girls your age. He sent two of them with you as backup, and together you all step out of the car and walk slowly up the gravel driveway toward the house. Okay, you two keep quiet. I'll do the talking. I'm cool with this guy, so we'll just get the money he owes me and maybe take his car and then we'll split. As you approach the house, the guy who owes you money opens the front door with a big smile on his face. Hey man, what are you guys doing out here? Come on, come on in. His name is Gary Hinman. You nod and follow him inside. Everyone sits down at the kitchen table and then you get down to business. Hey look Gary, you sold me a thousand bucks worth of mescaline. I sold it to some bikers and they said it's crap. I need to return their money or they're going to kick my ass. Hinman looks confused. Uh, there was nothing wrong with that batch. Don't lie to me, Gary. You pull a pistol from under your shirt and place it on the table. Hinman stares, eyes wide. Christ, what are you going to do with that? Nothing if you give me what I came for. I want the money, plus however much else you got. Seriously, I don't have any money. If I did, I'd hand it over, but you got to believe me. Look at this place. It's true. The room is sparsely furnished. Nothing much there at all. But you're not taking no for an answer. Oh, come on, you're a Buddhist, man. Not having stuff is your thing. Come on, we're not playing games here. You pull a knife from your belt and pick up the pistol. Hinman cringes. Look, look, look. There, there's, a, there's a VW bus and a Fiat out front. I'll, I'll sign them over to you. No problem. Well, that's a start, but I need the money. I can't give you what I don't have, man. Now you're getting frustrated. This isn't going according to plan. Hinman was supposed to be an easy mark. To show him you mean business, you smack him in the head with the pistol. But still, he refuses to come up with any cash. Maybe he really doesn't have money. You're not sure of your next move. Where's the damn phone, Gary? You decide to give Charlie a call. Maybe he'll know what to do next. He usually does. He's super smart. Seems to see things that you can't. So you're prepared to do whatever he tells you to do. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American History Tellers. Our history, your story. In the summer of 1969, Charles Manson was trying to maintain control over his flock of drug-addled followers. For the past two years, they had believed that he was the second coming of Jesus Christ, but some were beginning to doubt him. His prediction of a devastating race war he called Helter Skelter had failed to come true. His attempts at becoming a rock star had fizzled, and there was talk that his group's rent-free hideout, Spawn Ranch, might soon be up for sale. If that happened, the Manson family would be homeless. So Manson was desperate to get enough cash to relocate the family further east to Death Valley, where he had scouted a new possible hideout, somewhere he and his followers could wait out the race war he was certain was still coming. Manson had hoped to source that cash from an occasional drug dealer named Gary Hinman. But when Hinman turned out not to have any money, Manson decided it was time to take more drastic action. This is Episode 2, Helter Skelter. In July of 1969, when Manson got a call from his musician friend Bobby Beausoleil, that part-time drug dealer Gary Hinman was holding out, saying he didn't have any cash, Manson decided to step up the pressure himself. Twenty minutes later, Manson was standing in Hinman's living room with a sword. After a brief scuffle, he sliced the two-foot blade across the side of Hinman's head, nearly severing his ear. He warned him to cough up the cash or Beausoleil would finish him. 
Then Manson took Hinman's VW bus and drove back to Spawn Ranch. Beausoleil and the two female family members with him, Mary Bruner and Susan Atkins, stayed at Hinman's house for the next two days, occasionally beating their hostage. But still, Hinman refused to pay up. Finally, Beausoleil called Manson again, saying there was no money, but Hinman was now threatening to call the police as soon as they left. Manson couldn't allow that. And now he saw that Gary Hinman's purpose wasn't just to provide the family with money and vehicles. He could also become the catalyst for Helter Skelter, Manson's vision of a violent black versus white race war. Manson ordered Beausoleil to kill Hinman and to make it look like the work of African-American radicals. He gave detailed instructions. Beausoleil was to use his knife and write political piggies on the wall, along with a paw print, the iconic symbol of the Black Panthers, and he was to do it in blood. Beausoleil did as instructed, with the help from Atkins and Brewer. Afterward, they wiped the place of fingerprints as best they could and left. Beausoleil took him in's fiat with a bloody knife stashed in the car's spare tire well. The killers headed back to Spawn Ranch with empty pockets, but believing they had kick-started Helter Skelter. Four days later, on July 31st, L.A. County Sheriff's discovered Hinman's body and the bloody half-smeared paw print and piggy statement on the wall, but they didn't connect the clues to radicals, black or white. They did, however, find a fingerprint. They also issued an all-points bulletin on Hinman's missing Fiat and Volkswagen bus. By August 6th, Beausoleil was on the run. He headed for the Bay Area to hide out, using Hinman's Fiat to make his getaway. Driving north on Route 101, Beausoleil had engine trouble outside San Luis Obispo. He pulled over the stolen Fiat and decided to take a nap. When highway patrol officers noticed the stopped car and ran the plates, they discovered the vehicle was linked to a murder in L.A. County. They searched the car and found the bloody knife. Detectives matched the crime scene fingerprint to Beausoleil and booked him for homicide. Manson knew that if Beausoleil talked, the family was done for. Now, more than ever, he needed to not only jumpstart Helter Skelter, but avert suspicion away from Beausoleil. But the evidence was damning. Police had Beausoleil's fingerprint at the crime scene and the blood-caked murder weapon. But Manson thought he had a solution. Copycat killings. He told the family they needed to commit more murders that echoed the scene at Hinman's place, including anti-establishment statements written on the walls in blood. Manson believed that they could stage their crimes to make them look like the work of black radicals, and if they could do that, Beausoleil would be off the hook. Manson was confident with his plan. According to him, both the Bible and the Beatles had picked him to take control of the planet after the race riots of Helter Skelter. Plus, one of the girls had seen the copycat scenario work in a movie. But as Manson explained the plan to his followers, he left out one important detail. He would dictate where and how to commit the crimes, but he wouldn't participate. If the law came down on the killers, Manson wanted to make sure his own hands were clean. And he was certain that if the worst came, his followers would protect him and take the fall. On the night of August 8, 1969, Manson met with Tex Watson, his trusted second-in-command, to go over the plan. For their target, Manson selected the former home of music producer Terry Melcher. Manson had been there with Dennis Wilson, his famous friend from the Beach Boys, on a couple of occasions, so he was familiar with the location. Melcher's old home on 10,050 Cielo Drive in Benedict Canyon would be the prime murder site. Manson wasn't sure who lived there now, but he assumed that they were wealthy and well-connected, which would maximize publicity for the crime. He gave Watson a long-barreled twenty-two caliber buntline pistol. He told him to bring a knife, rope, bolt cutters, and a change of clothes. Manson was explicit about the attack, saying kill them, cut them up, pull out their eyeballs, and hang them on the mirrors, as gruesome as you can. To accompany Watson, Manson chose Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and a 20-year-old newcomer to the family named Linda Kasabian. Why Manson picked Kasabian is unclear, but he likely believed she would be a good getaway driver. She was one of the only family members with a valid driver's license. Manson told the entire team to bring knives, to follow Texas orders, and to leave a sign. He made no mention to the women that killing would be involved. Kasabian assumed they were going on what Manson called a creepy crawl, a common family activity of breaking into homes to steal a few items or rearrange the furniture. 
creepy crawling was just meant to scare people, and to Kasabian it was no big deal. So the group got into a beat-up 1959 Ford Galaxy sedan. As they departed on their 25-mile journey to Cielo Drive, Manson urged them to do something witchy. At about 12.30 a.m. on August 9th, in the warm, quiet darkness of Benedict Canyon, they arrived at their destination. Watson parked at the end of the winding driveway and cut the telephone wires. Then the women followed him over the fence by the electronic gate. In a quiet voice, he finally revealed the true purpose of their mission, to kill everyone in the house. Before the women could react to this news, they heard a car coming down the driveway and hid in the bushes. The driver was 18-year-old Stephen Parent. He'd been visiting his friend, 19-year-old William Gerritsen, the caretaker who lived in a small cottage behind the main house. When Parent stopped to open the gate, Watson stepped out from the shadows. Parent's last words were, Please don't hurt me. I'm your friend. I won't tell. Watson stabbed him, then shot him four times. Parent slumped across the driver's seat, dead. Then the group continued to the house. Watson ordered Kasabian to act as lookout. Numb with shock, Kasabian complied. Then Watson cut a window screen and slipped inside, followed by Atkins and Krenwinkel. The first person they encountered inside the house was Roman Polanski's Polish friend, Wojtek Frykowski, a 32-year-old actor and writer. He was asleep on a living room couch. As the women moved into the rest of the house, Frykowski awoke and asked Watson who he was. Watson kicked him in the head and said, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. In one of the bedrooms, Atkins found Abigail Folger, heiress to the Folger's coffee brand. Folger looked up from the book she was reading, smiled and waved, assuming Atkins was a friend of Tate's. Atkins waved back and kept moving. In the master bedroom, she found Sharon Tate, chatting with her former boyfriend, celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring. Atkins reported back to Watson, who told her to bring everyone to the living room. She delivered them at knife point as Watson and Krenwinkel waited. Then the mayhem began. Watson and Atkins bound the victims with rope and a towel. Sebring objected to the rough treatment of Tate, who was eight and a half months pregnant. Watson responded by shooting him. Then Watson demanded money, as Manson had instructed. Folger had about seventy dollars, and that was all the cash in the house. Frustrated, Watson stabbed the dying Sebring repeatedly as Tate and Folger screamed. The killers then set upon the two women and Frykowski. Outside, Kasabian was standing guard near the house. A man and a woman ran out bleeding, chased by Atkins and Watson. Kasabian begged the attackers to stop. When they didn't, she fled down the driveway and returned to the car. Watson ordered Krenwinkel to check the back cottage. She walked out of sight, but didn't follow orders. The family members never discovered caretaker William Gerritsen. Somehow, he slept through the entire ordeal. Sharon Tate was the last to die. The killers wrote the word pig on the front door in her blood. All told, they had murdered five people and an unborn baby. Then the gore-soaked family members piled back into a 59 Ford Galaxy and drove off into the night. Imagine it's the early morning hours of Saturday, August 9, 1969, in Benedict Canyon. You're in the car riding shotgun. Tex Watson is in the driver's seat but you've reached over to steer for him while he wriggles out of his bloody clothes. Susan Atkins and Patricia Krenwinkel are also changing in the back seat. You are in shock. The others just killed people. You weren't in the house with them, so you didn't see everything. But it was loud and horrific. And unlike you, they're not the least bit upset. Not about the murders, anyways. Atkins hisses at you from the back seat. Why'd you run? You were supposed to stand by the house and keep watch, not wait in the car. As you hand the wheel back to Tex, he glares at you, too. You can tell he's fuming. Look, I, I, I should have stayed, but I, I didn't want to see it. I wanted, wanted the screaming. The, the, I wanted it to stop. Atkins leans toward you from the back seat. She seems almost calm. Oh, we made it stop. Look, I know you're new to the family, but you have to remember. Life and death, they're the same thing. Just like Charlie says, we're all God and the devil. Yeah, he says that, but what happened in there? How... How could you do it? Akin shrugs. You do what you have to do. But what did you say to them? Akin smiles. 
You can't believe this is the same girl who once told you about singing in her church choir. I stared at that pregnant lady and I said, Look, bitch, I don't care a thing about you. You're going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. A chill runs down your spine. Everyone in the family talks constantly about love. How can they also be so cruel? Atkins rubs the back of her head. Hey, it's not like we didn't get hurt. My head is killing me. They were pulling my hair. One guy hit me with something. At this, Pat Kremwinkle pipes up from the other side of the back seat. Yeah, my hand hurts from all the stabbing. I kept hitting bone. You watch the night go by from the car window, trying to zone out and forget the horrors you've just witnessed. But then Atkins reaches over the seat and drops something in your lap. He tosses out the window. It's a wad of clothes, dark and heavy with blood. Tech slows down near an embankment. You throw it as far as you can. As he pulls away and picks up speed, you realize you better shut up about your feelings now that you've seen what these people are capable of. As Manson's family members fled the gruesome crime scene, one of them was shocked by the violence. Linda Kasabian had only joined the cult a month earlier, and the vicious attacks left her stunned. When the killers drove into Spawn Ranch, Manson was waiting and agitated. He couldn't understand why they were back in only a couple of hours. He demanded to know how they'd left the crime scene. Had they staged a horrific display? Had they written words in blood that linked the murders to Hinman's killing? Manson was unsatisfied with what he heard. It sounded too chaotic. So he immediately got in the car and drove back to Cielo Drive to inspect and arrange the crime scene to his liking. He draped an American flag upside down over the couch near Tate's body and threw a towel over Jay Sebring's face. He also wiped down surfaces to eliminate fingerprints. The next day, he scoured the newspapers. The crimes filled every headline, but there was nothing about the Black Panthers or the messages written in blood, nothing that would point the way to Helter Skelter. Manson was at the end of his rope, so he decided to order more killings the very next night. This time, though, to make sure it was done right, he'd go along himself. On Saturday, August 9, 1969, the local news in Los Angeles was filled with the horrific murders of Sharon Tate and her guests. It seemed like the whole city was talking about it. Rumor had it that the crimes were drug-related. In 1969, drugs and Hollywood went hand in hand. And back at Spawn Ranch, Charles Manson was already planning another round of violence to prove it wasn't drugs, but black radicals. This time, he was determined to make sure the public got his helter-skelter message. On the evening of Saturday, August 9th, less than 24 hours after the Tate killings, Manson picked his next hit squad. This time, Patricia Krenwinkel, Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Tex Watson would be accompanied by 19-year-old Leslie Van Houten, 18-year-old Clem Grogan, and Manson himself. Despite Kasabian's panic reaction to the Tate slayings, Manson still wanted her to come along as a possible backup driver because of her valid license. The group crowded into the old Ford Galaxy, armed with a handgun and an army surplus bayonet. They passed around joints as they drove. Manson directed them to a house in L.A. where he and some of the family had attended a couple of parties. It was on Waverly Drive in Los Feliz, a sedate middle-class neighborhood. And when they arrived, Manson told everyone to wait. He got out and trudged up the driveway to the home next door, 3301 Waverly Drive. He cased the property for about 15 minutes, then returned. He got the gun and told Watson to grab the bayonet and follow him. Inside the house, Lino and Rosemary LaBianca were relaxing. Lino was 44 and owned a chain of supermarkets. His wife, 38, co-owned a small clothes shop. Why Manson chose them as his next victims remains a mystery. Before targeting the LaBiancas, Manson had told his followers that he only wanted to kill rich, famous people. The LaBiancas were neither. Now, after midnight, Rosemary was in bed. Lino had fallen asleep on the living room couch reading the sports page. When the family members found them, they bound them both. Manson told them they wanted money and no one would get hurt. In the bedroom, Manson took Rosemary's wallet and told Watson to make sure everybody does something, then headed back to the car. He ordered Krenwinkle and Van Houten to go to the house and help, and as they headed up the driveway, Manson, Kasabian, Atkins, and Grogan drove away. 
Inside the house, the family members went to work. Lino received twelve deep bayonet wounds, crying out as Watson stabbed him, I'm dead, I'm dead. Rosemary heard the horror from the bedroom and began shrieking through her gag. Krenwinkel stabbed her repeatedly with a kitchen knife as the woman screamed and flailed. And finally, the house went quiet. Panting and blood splattered, the murderers carved the word war into Lino's stomach and stuck a kitchen knife in his throat. Mindful of Charlie's orders, they scrawled death to pigs and rise on the walls in blood. On their refrigerator, Krenwinkel added the words helter-skelter, but misspelled them. As the murdered couple lay motionless in growing pools of blood, the killers relaxed. They showered, romped with LaBianca's dogs, and raided the refrigerator, helping themselves to watermelon and chocolate milk. Before leaving to hitchhike back to Spawn Ranch, they made sure to deposit the melon rinds neatly in the sink. On Sunday morning, the bodies of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca had still not been discovered. But some authorities were already attempting to link the previous day's Tate case to another murder, one that had taken place two weeks earlier. Imagine it's Sunday, August 10th, 1969, at Los Angeles Police Department offices in downtown Los Angeles. You're one of the detectives on the Tate case. Since it was assigned to you, you barely had a break. So you're sitting down at your desk trying to eat something while you wait for the autopsy reports on the five victims. But apparently your sandwich is going to have to wait. Homicide. This Michael McGann? No, he's out. I'm his partner. Who's calling? Detective Sergeant Paul Whiteley, Sheriff's Office. When do you expect him back? Like most LAPD detectives, you're no fan of the county sheriffs poking their noses into your cases, and you know your partner isn't either. You decide that for his sake, you'll handle this yourself. No, not for several hours. We're up to our necks in this Tate case. What's on your mind, detective? Well, I know you're busy, so I'll keep this quick. Look, last week I got called on a possible homicide in Topanga. I go to a house out there and we find a guy stabbed all to hell. Hinman. Gary Hinman. Hinman? No, it doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, small-time drug dealer. Psychedelics, mostly. Anyway, I'm looking at the scene description in this Tate thing, and I'm seeing similarities. Similarities? Like what? Like words in the victim's blood on the walls. You got Tate's place with pig, while Hinman's place had political piggy. Yeah. Oh, that, that is a coincidence. You make any arrests? We did. A hippie kid. Robert Beausoleil. Caught him driving Hinman's car. Had the murder weapon stashed in the vehicle. Well, with all due respect, but there's no way one guy killed five people at the Tate house. Especially not some hippie. Yeah, of course. I know Beausoleil didn't do it. He was in custody when Tate happened, but maybe he had accomplices. Uh, he talked about hanging out at a ranch in Chatsworth with a bunch of other hippies. It sounds to me like some weird cult run by uh, someone named Charlie. His followers think he's Jesus or something. Jesus, huh? Now, that doesn't sound like our crime scene. The Tate killings are drug-related. Nothing to do with hippies and <laughs> certainly not Jesus. You sure? I mean, our victim was dealing. Nothing major, but still. And the words and blood on the walls at both scenes... There are some high odds against it all being a coincidence. <sighs> you sigh and loosen your tie. These county guys are always grasping at straws. Why would the Tate killers have anything to do with some dead hippie in Topanga? You decide it's time to wrap this up. Look, Detective, I appreciate the information, and we'll be sure to look into it. But if you don't hear from us within a week or so, it means we're on to something else. But still, good luck with your case. You hang up the phone and finally tuck into your tuna sandwich. You consider telling your partner or your supervisor about the conversation with Detective Whiteley, but decide against it. The last thing you need is some wild goose chase for multiple murderers. You know your theory is solid. The murders were the result of a major drug deal gone wrong. The county guys can look into that Hinman thing all they want. You've got your own case to solve. On Sunday, August 10th, just one day after the Tate killings, Detectives from the L.A. County Sheriff's Department contacted the LAPD to share details about Gary Hinman's murder. But the LAPD detective who took the call refused to see any connections to the Tate murders and failed to report the call. The two cases remained unlinked. That evening, the LaBianca's stepson dropped by the Waverly Drive house. The family boat was out in the street, not stowed in the garage as usual, and the shades were drawn. Alarmed, he called his sister. She arrived at the house with her boyfriend. Together they entered 
and discovered the tragic scene inside. Police arrived at the home at 10.30 p.m. They noted the similarities to the Tate murders, but remarkably dismissed the possibility that the crimes were connected. The victims had nothing to do with each other, and the police felt that two back-to-back nights of such savagery couldn't possibly be the work of one person or even a group of people. Instead, LAPD detectives developed another theory. They thought the LaBianca murders were a copycat crime, done to disguise a mafia hit. Lino was an Italian-American and a serious gambler, allegedly amassing some quarter million dollars in debts. Police believed the mob had read about the Tate crime scene and staged the LaBianca murders to resemble it. The LAPD now had two hot investigations taking place, but they were run by different factions, and those factions didn't see eye to eye. The LaBianca case was led by younger detectives, and the Tate case by veterans. The two teams didn't cooperate or share information, and neither faction was talking to L.A. County sheriffs about the murder of Gary Hinman. And on August 12th, the LAPD made it official, announcing to the press that the Tate and LaBianca cases were not connected. Manson was stunned. How could the cops not put this together? but they appeared to be clueless. Not only had they failed to connect the murders to the Black Panthers, they had failed to connect the crimes at all. They were treating them as random homicides. So on the morning of Saturday, August 16th, Manson was even more surprised when the cops raided Spawn Ranch. They rounded up 26 family members, including Manson. But then an officer told Manson that he was under arrest for auto theft, and he felt a weight lift from his shoulders. The cops still hadn't connected the Tate and LaBianca murders, and they certainly had no idea they'd just nabbed the perpetrators. And then on Monday, a legal glitch allowed the family members to walk free. The warrant had the wrong date on it, and the family headed back to the ranch. But Manson knew they'd been lucky. Sooner or later, the cops would wise up. Manson had already been making preparations for the family to flee Spawn Ranch ahead of Helter Skelter. Now, the time to flee had come. On September 1st, Manson took his followers to a remote spot he had found in Death Valley, called Barker Ranch. It was 200 miles northeast of Los Angeles, and several miles from anywhere civilized. There was a tiny cabin made from rocks, no electricity, no telephone, and little water. The extremely rough dirt roads made it virtually inaccessible. Accordingly, life at Barker was not easy. It was hot and dusty, with few amenities. The place made Spawn Ranch look like a five-star hotel, and dissension was growing in the ranks of the family. Newer members were treated coldly by originals like Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Lynette Squeaky Fromm. They took pride in their tight relationship with Manson, who now seemed to be chronically angry. Manson treated most of the family like slaves, ordering them out into the desert each day on an endless hunt for the bottomless pit— the mythical hiding place Manson had promised they'd live in when Helter Skelter broke out. Even Manson loyalist Tex Watson was fed up. He was seriously questioning Charlie's plans, motives, and mental stability. In mid-September, he took a car and escaped to his parents' house in Texas. Watson's departure shocked Manson. He announced that anyone else trying to leave would be killed. And for several weeks, the family managed to stay put and lay low. It seemed like the Barker's Ranch location was remote enough to escape the eye of the authorities. But Manson's young followers couldn't stay quiet for long. On September 19th, a vandalized earth mover owned by Inyo County was discovered, burnt to a crisp not far from Barker. It was an expensive loss, and county officials didn't take it lightly. They launched an investigation. Authorities soon got reports that a hippie cult was ripping up the desert around Barker Ranch, driving dune buggies that were likely stolen. Drugs were probably involved. Arson and auto theft were serious crimes, and the Manson family had a lot more to hide than just stolen cars. Manson knew that if they were caught again, this time, their luck might run out. They might get charged with murder. On October 10, 1969, Inyo County sheriffs raided Barker Ranch. They arrested 13 men and women, including Squeaky Fromm, Susan Atkins, and Patricia Krenwinkel. The authorities confiscated weapons and eight stolen vehicles. But there was no sign of the leader, a guy the cops knew only as Charlie, who these people considered to be Jesus. 
Manson was in L.A., hustling money. He returned to the ranch the next day to find only a few remaining family members who had escaped arrest. He stayed at the ranch until two days later when authorities decided to make another sweep on October 12th. As the sun was setting, California Highway Patrolman James Purcell drew his gun and came in the rear door of the cabin. The place had no electricity, so he picked up a candle and with his 44 drawn and ready, began searching the house. When he crept into the bathroom in the flickering light, he noticed some long hair sticking out of the small cabinet under the sink. Slowly, the door opened. A man was in there, curled up in a tight ball. As Purcell kept his gun on him, the tiny fellow emerged and stood up. He was dressed head to toe in buckskin. He smiled politely at Purcell and said hello. The officer asked his name, and he replied, Charlie Manson. Now, authorities finally had a last name for this would-be Jesus. At the Inyo County Jail, the family members were booked for arson and grand theft auto. But so far, no one had connected them with any murders. That would soon change. Even in custody, most family members were still very loyal to Charles Manson. But not all of them. Among those arrested in the Inyo County sweeps was Kitty Lutzinger, Bobby Beausoleil's pregnant teenage girlfriend. Since Beausoleil's arrest, she'd been stuck with the family, but she was sick of life in the desert. She'd never been a true family convert, and Manson freaked her out. And because she was known as Beausoleil's girlfriend, when word of her arrest reached L.A. County Sheriff's detectives, they quickly arranged an interview. They were still investigating the murder of Gary Hinman, and now the girlfriend of their prime suspect was in custody. They hoped she might help them finally crack the case. But Lutzinger just wanted to go home and was only too happy to cooperate. She revealed Manson's involvement and that a girl named Susan had helped Beausoleil kill Hinman. Susan told Lutzinger that she had also knifed a man in the legs who'd been pulling her hair during some other crime. That detail was curious to the lawman. Hinman had been stabbed in the chest, not the legs. The county detectives passed this on to the LAPD crew working the Tate case. Wasn't one of the victims in their crime stabbed in the legs? LAPD detectives duly noted Lutzinger's information, but did not reach out to her. They were busy hunting down other leads and missed another opportunity to finally connect the Tate killings to Manson. Then on October 14th, county detectives interviewed Susan Atkins. She confirmed the story of the Hinman killing, but stated she hadn't done the stabbing. Nor did she mention Manson. Manson's name was now on the L.A. County Sheriff's Department's radar in connection to the Hinman case, but their evidence against him was flimsy, based almost entirely on Lutzinger's statement. Manson was still in custody for the arson charge, but if they didn't find anything concrete soon, authorities would have to release him. Other family members also remained locked up. Susan Atkins was transferred to the Sybil Brand Institute, a tough, all-female jail in Los Angeles. Atkins quickly developed a reputation as being perky and chipper, skipping around the place like it was a park. To the other inmates, her cheerful behavior was creepy. Atkins was assigned a cell with two other women, both former prostitutes with long rap sheets, currently in for minor violations. Atkins chatted nonstop with them. She loved to talk, but even to hardened cons, the stories this sweet young girl was spinning were the stuff of nightmares. Imagine it's an early November evening in 1969 at the Sybil Brand Women's Jail in Los Angeles. Your new cellmate Susan is talking your ear off, and you're beginning to see why the other cons here call her Crazy Sadie. But any conversation, no matter how crazy, helps pass the time, so you happily engage her. So, what are you in for, Sadie? First-degree murder. No kidding. Who did you kill? You don't expect an honest answer. Cons like to brag and exaggerate their offenses, but it's never smart to blab the actual details of your crimes. But crazy Sadie doesn't seem to be aware of that jailhouse rule. Oh, it was some guy named Hinman. I stabbed him while Bobby held him down. The cops are so dumb, though. They think it was the other way around. They'll never prove I did it. Well, I, you got that going for you, I guess. I know. The sooner I can get back to Charlie, the better. He's Jesus, you know, but cooler. We need to find the bottomless pit in the desert so we can hide during Helter Skelter. You've heard some nutty things in lockup. But this? Well, it sounds like they can't nail you for this Hinman thing. 
You'll be back to Charlie Christ in your hole in the desert soon, I guess. Yeah, and they'll never get me for the one in Benedict Canyon, either. This gets your interest. Sounds familiar. Benedict Canyon? You don't mean Sharon Tate, do you? Yes, Yellow Drive. And you know who did it? You're looking at her. You sit up in your cot and lock eyes with Susan. Are you being serious? Yeah, Charlie told us what to do. Me and three others from the family. Kill all the people in the house. He even picked the address. Some record guy used to live there. I I read about this, but come on, you weren't really there, were you? Oh, yeah, I I bet you didn't read that we made nooses around their necks. And I stabbed that one guy who was pulling my hair. And when he ran on the lawn, I chased him and stabbed him some more. Wow. Well, that is pretty wild, Susan. (laughs) Pretty wild. You should have seen Tate begging for her life, yelling for her mother. She just wouldn't shut up, but I shut her up. And you should have seen what we did with those two other people the next night. Two two other people? Yeah, in Los Feliz. Susan keeps talking, offering horrifying details. You're no snitch, but this is too much. Even if she's making it all up, you need to tell someone about crazy Sadie's wild rantings. Because what if she's not making it up? Inmate Ronnie Howard sat on Atkins' confession for a few days, unsure whether to tell anyone. It didn't seem possible that this sweet, small young woman could have been part of such a terrible crime. She must have been making it up. But Howard couldn't shake the feeling that Atkins might be telling the truth. When she compared notes with another con who'd listened to Atkins' murder monologues, that convinced her. The details were identical. Atkins' story, as crazy as it sounded, was consistent. So on November 17th, Howard was taken to a hearing for her case. She was allowed to use a payphone at the courthouse, and she called the LAPD and said she knew who killed the Tate and La Bianca victims. The following day, detectives met with Howard at Sybil Brand and listened to what she had to say. They had good reason to believe that her story wasn't idle jailhouse talk. The day before, they'd met with a biker who knew Manson and had heard him brag about knocking off rich people in Benedict Canyon and Los Feliz. The biker had details about the Tate and La Bianca crime scenes that had not been made public. Armed with this mounting evidence, the LAPD was certain they had their killers, and the Tate and La Bianca investigators were finally working in tandem. Together, they had concluded these crimes were not drug-related or mafia retribution. They were something far more perplexing and sinister. On December 9, 1969, Charles Manson, Patricia Krenwinkel, Susan Atkins, Leslie Von Houten, Charles Tex Watson, and Linda Kasabian were indicted by a grand jury for the Tate and LaBianca murders. Manson was locked up at the Hall of Justice in downtown Los Angeles. The law enforcement community could finally breathe easier. But as word spread in the public, the reaction was confusion. There was no simple explanation for the violence, and Manson was instantly a subject of intense fascination, a mysterious hippie clad in homemade buckskin. Rumors ran wild about this self-styled desert guru and his nomadic, bloodthirsty cult of young women. According to many reports, he was some kind of Satanist, a demonic charmer working in the black arcs, a Svengali capable of hypnotizing followers to do his dark bidding. But his appearance didn't reflect any of that. He was small in stature, and when he smiled his dimpled grin, he seemed almost appealing. He just didn't look like a monster, especially in chains and handcuffs, surrounded by a group of police escorts who easily dwarfed him. But the brutal murders of seven people, including a pregnant woman, argued otherwise, and the public fascination for Manson was an unexpected silver lining to the murder charges. He still wasn't a rock star, like he'd always dreamed of being, But suddenly, he was famous. People were taking his picture and hanging on his every word. And he may have been under arrest, but in the eyes of the law, he still had to be proven guilty. Manson and the family were a long way from being convicted. So far, the authorities had made one mistake after another. The court system offered no guarantee that it would do any better. And soon, more shocking details would emerge, details that would make the Manson murders one of the most complex criminal trials in U.S. history. But one thing was certain. The Manson family would be fighting for their lives. If they lost their case, they would be headed to the gas chamber. From Wondery, this is Episode 2 of our three-part series, The Manson Murders from American History Tellers. On the next episode, the Manson family goes on trial for the Tate-LaBianca murders, 
And as the press gears up for the trial of the century, Manson and his still-devout followers are determined to fight the accusations with every bit of madness they can muster. If you'd like to learn more about the Manson family, we recommend Manson, The Life and Times of Charles Manson by Jeff Gwynn, Helter Skelter by Vincent Bugliosi, and The Garbage People by John Gilmore and Ron Kenner. American History Tellers is hosted, edited, and produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing and sound design by Molly Bach. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Peter Gilstrap, edited by Dorian Marina. Our senior producer is Andy Herman. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer-Beckman and Marsha Louie for Wondery.